I'd like to now turn to um, one of the more important uh, interpretive strategies in historiography and philosophy of history in the 20th century. And that is the movement that I call neo-idealism. And uh, we are going to examine one particular text, the epilogomena to R.G. Collingwood's The Idea of History. Uh, first, a word or two about neo-idealism. Uh, neo-idealism was a movement in the early uh, 20th century, in the first half, um, <clears throat> which emerged in many different European nations, which uh, very strongly attempt to extract what they saw as the valid and rational essence of the Hegelian system without its most sort of uh, vulgar excesses. And I'll, and I'll talk about what that means in a couple minutes. Um, Neo-idealism has had a, an extremely profound effect on the writing and uh, analysis of history. In fact, to some extent, it's been one of the most dominant modes of historical analysis in this century uh, and in the United States and its historiography as well. Some of the famous names of this movement are figures like, uh, well, Benedetto Croce in Italy, to some extent, Leo Strauss, uh, a man at least inspired to some extent by Hegelianism at the University of Chicago, and of course, Robin Collingwood. Collingwood was, however, an historian as well as a philosopher. And his work then is an example of this idealist movement, which is not only insightful philosophically, but informed by the realities of actual historical scholarship. And there's a sensitivity to the real practices of the historian as opposed to the large schematizations of the armchair historian slash philosopher. Um, Collingwood's uh, neo-idealism eliminates, like Croce's, several of the worst excesses uh, of Hegel's system. For example, Collingwood makes no claim to any analysis of history as a whole. He offers us no interpretation of the meaning of all of history, its trajectory, where it's been, and where it's going. Um, it embraces no particular political agenda. It, in fact, comes in a variety of ideological guises, from left to right. But what it shares with Hegelianism is a commitment to an idealist reading of historical action, as well as a commitment to historicism. Now, I, I'd like to note right away that Collingwood's book is not just a work on philosophy of history, it's a history of history as well. The first section of the book deals with thinking, the idea of history as it has come to us through the ages, from Thucydides, the ancient epoch, right up to his day. Um, we're going to ignore that part and deal with the last section, the epilogomena, which details his philosophy of history, his theory of history, and his model of historical interpretation and analysis. Now, what do we mean by idealism? Well, in the case of Collingwood and 20th century neo-idealism, it means that actions are always read or interpreted as the expression of a particular thought, mentality, or culture. And that this thought, this intellectual or ideal content, one might call it reason, is what explains these actions or these events. That somehow understanding the mentality or the thought behind an event, behind an action, gives us an insight, an understanding, an explanation, a key to not only interpreting, but explaining that event or that action. Now, we've mentioned previously, historicism means that historical events are unique, that all culture and all conceptions are rooted in historical realities, in realities of space and time, and that there is no super-historical or supra-historical ground of judgment or criticism, that we are all rooted in a particular place and moment in time, and that our uh, criterion of judgment are always historically rooted, and we cannot, as it were, get outside of our historical sin, uh, skins. This also means that reason and rationality itself are an historically developing cultural modality or activity. 
right? There is no abstract reason which transcends its development in time. So what is rational is a function of the development of reason or rational cognitive activity up to a particular moment and not beyond. Okay, I want then to turn to what seem to me to be the, the major themes in Collingwood's work and they're themes which we've seen before in previous lectures. History for Collingwood is indeed the science of human nature, that project that we'd heard of in the Enlightenment. Now, Collingwood argues that the Enlightenment science of human nature failed basically because of its false analogy to the natural sciences. The notion being that the mind was an eternal sort of constant structure of modalities, of cognitive apprehensions, and of emotional proclivities, that there was a fixed and set human nature. That, of course, Collingwood thinks is mistaken. Human psychology changes over time. Our character changes. Our features change as we evolve through history. Mind, in fact, that, that core to which we, we attempt to, to get in our science of human nature can only be understood through its operations. And those operations always occur in time. So mind, in fact, can only be understood in its actions over time, which is history. So history discloses to us the science of the human mind as it develops across time and across space. This should never be confused with psychology. All right. Psychology studies what he considered mere consciousness. Now, what does he mean by mere consciousness? He means, again, a purely phenomenal apprehension of mental states, states of anger, of pleasure, of joy, uh, various emotional states, physical um, uh, or mental awareness of physical states like pain, uh, discomfort, and hunger. He wants to distinguish that part of our mental life from what he calls thought the rational activity, the purely cognitive part of mind. And it's that rational activity, that thought, which is, in fact, disclosed by the science of, uh, by history, which is the science of human nature. So what history unfolds, according to idealism, is the development of thought, thought being the unique part of the human mind. Since all animals have the same phenomenal that all animals with neural structures have the same phenomenal awareness we do. They all feel pain, pleasure, have various proclivities, uh, feel affection perhaps. Anyone who's ever had a dog knows dogs feel affection of some sort or another. All of those emotional responses are held by the other animals. What's unique to humans is the cognitive part of mind, the ability to posit thought, rational activity, and conception. Now, the fundamental distinction that informs all of Collingwood's thinking is between what he calls the two features of an event. He speaks of history having, or every event, or every action, having an inside and an outside. Now, this is a very hard doctrine. Let me begin first by saying what the outside is, because that's much more straightforward. The outside of an event is its physical manifestation. The outside of um, this lecture is the particular uh, motions that I go through, my walking, my gesturing with my hand, uh, and the various sounds I produce from my larynx and my, uh, my, my lungs. All of these features, these physical aspects, can be described naturalistically, can be reduced to a scientific anatomical or biological description. That's what characterizes the outside of events. It's, as it were, the physical shell within, through which we see events. Right? So the outside of events is always the purely physical, the purely naturalistic. Well, once I've eliminated that, hopefully you get a sense of what's supposed to be on the inside, the good stuff. Um, the inside is the rational thought that's behind an event, the principles that inform the event, that which the event expresses in terms of cognitive activity or ideal um, development. Now, for Collingwood, the key point is that history proper 
is really the history of thought or the insides of events. There is thus no history of nature because natural events have no insides. There is no thought expressed in the activity of bees or in uh, geological developments or in uh, changes in forestation patterns. They have no in insides, thus natural history is called history by convenience only. It's not really history. History proper is always the study of the inside of events and events that have insides. Now, this not only excludes uh, non-human activity, it also excludes certain human activities. Some of our actions are purely instinctual, are purely mechanical, are purely naturalistic. For example, for Collingwood, there is no history of sanitation or of people's dietary habits unless those things somehow express some sort of thought or conception. They are not part of history. There is no history of the development of the human musculature. Right? That would be part of a natural science, perhaps a natural history, but not history proper. Only those actions and events which contain a latent inside, an expression of thought, of conception, some ideal characteristic, are part of the subject matter of history. And in this sense, we can see that uh, Collingwood is offering us a sort of watered-down version of the classic idealist dualism between two metaphysical realms, the metaphysical realm of nature, of pure um, law-like behavior, and the other realm, the realm of spirit, of mind, of freedom, uh, whether conceived of Kanti as Kantian autonomy or something else. And it is with the latter that history is concerned. Okay. Now, history works and history explains and the historian functions by, in fact, reenacting past experience. Now, this is a very strange sort of doctrine. It's as if, at first, it might seem as if Collingwood is enjoining us to march uh, across the Rubicon again to be able to understand what Caesar did. But rather, what Collingwood is arguing is that what the historian does when he tries to understand something is recover the inside of an event by putting himself in his own mind in the position of the agents in question. So we recover the inside of the event of Caesar's crossing the Rubicon by thinking ourselves into the situation of Caesar. We're faced with a fundamental challenge. Crassus has died in Mesopotamia. Pompey has now tried uh, to use the Senate to exclude um, Caesar from power, has tried to rob him of his army. What must he have been thinking when he crossed the Rubicon? What did that express? And clearly it expressed the desire for uh, the creation of imperial power on his part. So what we're doing, in fact, when we reenact the past is really reenacting the thought of the past, the inside of the event, the, the uh, sort of historical nugget contained within some action. And that can only be done through the use of what he calls the a priori imagination. Is a very sort of Kantian notion. What is the a priori imagination? We all have some schematization of what a society must be like, of what a situation must be like. When we try to reenact some past experience, when we think ourselves into the position of Caesar, we try to embellish what circumstances are missing, perhaps, from uh, a direct account of Caesar's actions by imagining what must have been the case. So we, in fact, don't know um, exactly what occurred in Lincoln's mind on the way to uh, constructing the Gettysburg Address. But we can, in our imagination, imagine the circumstances that must have laid be lay before him. He must have been, been thinking about his upcoming election. He must have been thinking about the New York City draft riots, which had just occurred in New York. Could not have helped but impact him. He must have been thinking about uh, the incredible uh, dissension that was occurring in the North as Northerners debated whether this war was really worth fighting, given the immense carnage that had just happened at this battle. So the, the a priori imagination for the historian, and a priori means before the facts, before we actually know what happened, allows us to conjecture 
and fill in the details in a social circumstance which we might not have, but which we have to construct or add. Otherwise, we simply won't have enough data to go along. Now, this a priori imagine, imagination not only um, bridges the gap between sources and actions, it also helps us provide a continuous narrative. We know Caesar crosses the Rubicon. We also know, at some point later, he takes care of Pompey. We, d we don't actually have a record of each step he made. We must, it's this a priori historical imagination which leads us to conclude he must have marched from point A to point B. It fills in the gaps between our evidence and supplies us with a continuous narrative, a straightforward story that, that uh, overcomes the spaces. And we find this uh, registered in historical accounts whenever we see the word perhaps, must have, surely. Surely Lincoln must have been aware of the ramifications of the Emancipation Proclamation. We don't know that he did, but it's, it's certainly plausible that he did, and that's the function of the historical a priori imagination, to supply those details from our own basic uh, conceptions of how a time operates and how a society operates. Now again, the historical a priori imagination, in accord with historicism, is always relative to its time. When we think of how a society must operate, our model will always be our own society and our own experiences. We may have, be able to enrich that through reenacting past experiences, getting a richer sense of how previous societies must have worked. But it can never be an absolute cognition. It's always something which is, to some extent, relative to our own range of experience. Okay, what does that mean? The a priori imagination turns out to also be a criterion of evaluation and judgment. We come across a document as an historian. We come across a chronicle. Do we treat that chronicle or document as an authority? Do we say that whatever is in it is either true or false? If it's true, we include it. If it's false, we reject it. Or do we treat it as a source and perhaps read it in such a way as to reveal what uh, hidden conceptions or assumptions underlay that moment. We read the trial of Anne Hutchinson in Massachusetts. We find in it uh, various criticisms about uh, her behavior in holding uh, illegal church meetings. We, uh, we hear that she gives birth to a monstrous uh, deformity and therefore is a child of, of the devil. Do we from that assume that either Anne Hutchinson was in fact in league with the devil or that this text should just be thrown out? Or do we rather, in accord with the historical a priori imagination, say we don't believe in the devil, we don't believe she was in league with the devil, but it does tell us something very important, doesn't it? They believed she was in contact with the devil. They interpreted that event in accord with those beliefs. Those beliefs are what animated their behavior and they interpreted it as a sign of their rectitude which may suggest that they may have had some doubts about their own rectitude, hence the need to find some sort of evidence to prove that they were really right in banish banishing Anne Hutchinson. So in fact, it's the historical a priori imagination which allows us to criticize evidence and to use it not as authority, but as a source, as a source which needs, which needs to be interpreted and reconstructed in accord with our assumptions about how the past must have functioned. Now, another difference between the science of history and the, the natural sciences is one I've mentioned, the natural sciences are only concerned with the outsides of events, never the inside. But there's another important difference as well, and one that separates Collingwood and neo-idealists from people like Toynbee. And that is that the concern of the historian for Collingwood is always ideographic. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's a contrast to uh, what's called nomothetic concerns. Science is concerned with laws, nomos. And uh, the function of science is to look at particular examples so that they can, culling from those examples and the regularities in them, pr uh, produce general principles, general laws, general formulas, which explain the vast range of phenomena that have been analyzed. History has the opposite concern, and that's called ideographic. It's concerned with the individual, with the unique. 
We do not examine the American Revolution to learn about the structure of revolutions. We examine the American Revolution because we want to know what happened in the American Revolution. It's a unique event. We don't examine the American Civil War to understand the nature of civil wars. We understand the American Civil War, uh, or we analyze it, try to explain it, because we want to know the particularity of that event. Our concern is not with any laws. Our concern is not with any regularities. Our concern, as students of the past, is always with the particular, with the unique, with the individual event, structure, or uh, action. So what history is concerned with then, fundamentally, is the recovery of the meaning or thought of some particular event, rather than the laws determining events of a similar or comparative nature. Now this concern with motivation, with what lays behind an event, and the criticism of sources and evidence suggests that um, all of history is done in accord with the a priori imagination, and that the previous models we have of how the historian functions are mistaken. To think of the historian as essentially a chronicler, as an assembler of sources, as an assembler of evidence, is in fact wrong. The best model for the work of the historian, Collingwood argues, is a detective. Consider how a, a detective does his work. He's presented with a series of accounts, some of which may conflict. What he's concerned to find there is, first of all, what must this agent have been thinking? What position is this agent in? Is this tr person trying to cover up for himself, for someone else? Is there some reason to doubt the, uh, the honesty of this account? Is this account plausible, given uh, our a priori imagination of human motivation? It's precisely those considerations that, that work for, for, for a, uh, a detective. When he sees a shooting, or when he comes to a crime scene and, and there's been a shooting, He's not interested in, necessarily, the trajectory of the bullet, unless that serves to establish some the location of the criminal. He's much more concerned to say, all right, now why? Why was there a shooting? What motives uh, could someone have had to have killed this person? And once I've determined the motives, then I can look at the people who had that motivation. And once I I've had that motivation, I can then look at what they told me happened and judge it relative to that motivation and relative to what's plausible. So the historian is really a detective who interrogates his sources. Right? He um, looks at the papers of um, Madison, looks them over for uh, uh, insight into his political life, and draws inferences from them. He may draw inferences from the absence of papers. Madison burnt a big chunk of his papers before he died. No evidence. Need the historian be silent there? No. He can use his a priori imagination. Why would Madison have burnt his papers? What is missing in his papers? What period does that cover? Does it cover the period when he went up to New York on a botany expedition, which he claimed was went up with Thomas Jefferson to meet um, Governor Clinton of New York and, and uh, study some botanical um, plants? Or is it possible, given the fact that he burnt those papers that deal with the trip, the letters from that time, and that shortly thereafter, Clinton, Madison, and Jefferson organized the first Jeffersonian party, that in fact what was really going on was that they were organizing the first party, which was something which was considered illegitimate and treasonous at the time, or at least not treasonous, at least less patriotic and ideal in its statesmanship than ought to have been, and knowing that full well, he burnt his papers so we would not know it. What piece of historical a priori imagination from our own time do we use to build that conjecture? Well, we know one of our presidents planned to have a big bonfire after he left office. And he got caught just before he had a chance to burn everything, and that, that being um, President uh, Nixon. We know he was going to burn stuff that was incriminating to him. We have a similar action in the past. We infer from that, just like a detective, given our experiences with politicians, Madison had something in his closet. It's had some skeleton in his closet that we wish to uh, we wish to hide. Now I, I bring that point up off, off the top of my head, not because that's necessarily true, but that's an example of how the historian works. It's not a redactive copying from sources. Sources. It's a use of his own critical faculties 
in judging sources and trying to get to motivations, trying to get to the thought that might be behind some activity, some event. Now, there is something peculiar about this notion of the inside of events, which I have to point out right away. We're not necessarily concerned with, always, the actual thought that the agent had at the moment he did an action. We're interested with the thought that that action expressed. When Caesar crossed the Rubicon at that moment, he might have been thinking about, you know, a, a goblet of wine and um, a nice steak dinner. That may have been his thought. Rather, we want to know what was the meaning of that passage. What thought did it express? And it expressed the thought of desire for political power and the solution to a uh, time of troubles through the creation of a huge empire. So the inside of events should never be read quite psychologically as the exact thought that was in the moment in the agent's mind at that moment. The agent may have, in fact, been unaware to some extent of the significance of his action, but there's always some thought that can be uh, recovered from it. He may come to understand his own action later after he's done it. And uh, many events of that can, can be thought of. When someone first fired uh, on Fort Sumter in South Carolina, undoubtedly they did not think they were beginning the Civil War. They thought they were beginning Southern Secession, which would very quickly be ratified, and then there'd be two distinct nations. Later on, that person might have realized that the thought expressed in his action was beginning this huge cataclysmic struggle. Okay. So as a result, we also know something else. History is exclusively concerned with fields of action that have an inside. And not all fields of action do. So what we mean by that are fields of action or sorts of activities that are reflective, that require some cognition, some thought. And this means that they are always purposive. They always are goal-centered. They're always uh, done with some particular end in mind. OK, what are some of the uh, examples of this? Politics. Politics is a purpose of activity, which expresses thoughts, desires, goals, and ambitions. Right? So political history is a history which reveals an inside. Napoleon, the inside of his activities was the, uh, the desire for a United, uh, United States of Europe, roughly, uh, under a large imperial hegemony based on a rule of civil law, of civil equality. What other things? Well, warfare. Military history has an inside. Different strategies, different tactics are all purposeful. They're all planned. They all uh, respond to circumstances in a reflective way. They may also express features of a culture or society. Uh, again, an example. Americans were well reputed in the 19th century for the absolutely vicious way they fought wars. Um, in the fact that they rarely distinguished between combatants and non-combatants. That women and children were not safe and people out of, so out of uniform were not safe. That's not simply, uh, to use Collingwood's phrase, a, um, a contingency. That expresses a thought, uh, a reflective reality about the way they thought of the world. America was the most democratic society in the world. In a democracy, everyone is equal. If you're at war with a nation, you're at war with everyone in the nation, whether they wear a uniform or not. Right? There's no clear sense of hierarchy. For that reason, uh, in the American Civil War, when Sherman felt the war had gone on a bit too long, he marched from Atlanta to the sea. There were no soldiers between Atlanta and the sea. He wasn't fighting any soldiers. He burnt everything. He ripped up every piece of uh, rail line along the way and produced Sherman's neckties. They wrapped them around trees. Basically turned the South back to the Neolithic Age, burnt everything, stole everything, and it was as if the uh, huge 50-mile-long stretch, a couple miles wide, had been nuked. And that expresses something. It expresses a change in strategy, a reflection about the way war must be fought successfully. And it also expresses a, a, a conception of the nature of the society within which he was a member and the equality of all people, that these women and children uh, on these plantations who are producing food are, in fact, soldiers. The food they produce supports this, their husbands and, and brothers in the field, or their sons in the field. And at the same time, when they send letters to their families, to their to beloved ones at the front, saying, 
you know, the farm just got burnt down, we're real hungry, we can expect that those soldiers will return home quite shortly. Other fields, religion, clearly is a purpose of activity. It's clearly exactly the sort of field in which we could have a, a history. There's an inside to religious events. Philosophy, right? In philosophy, it's a purpose of rational activity. We can see the development of one school of philosophy from another, dealing with the paradigms, the problems, the issues that had been raised in uh, previous moments. And finally, of course, art is another excellent example of purpose of activity. And such, it can be reduced to a history of art. Right? It can be, we can see the inside of art. We see in uh, early Renaissance painting an expression of humanism. With the Baroque period, we see an expression of the dramatic context of light and dark, the sublime and the natural. We see with uh, Impressionism a realization that photography has made realism a uh, no longer tenable uh, goal for art, that art must somehow transcend that and deal with the problem of uh, perhaps perception. With Cubism, a realization of uh, the perspectival nature of perception itself and um, an attempt to put a time dimension into painting. And then finally, with abstract expressionism, a realization that, the, that art ultimately expresses more than it represents. And therefore, we can give over form and the expression of anything in particular and simply express in an abstract manner uh, through daubing paint on canvas. Okay. The next uh, issue for Collingwood is the question of freedom and progress in history. Now, for, Hag for Collingwood, like Hegel, human freedom can only be affirmed if we reject historical naturalism, if we reject the sort of enlightenment doctrines which argue that humans are just like any other animals, if we accept a materialistic analysis like Marx's, to some extent like Weber's, it is impossible to affirm human freedom, because then we are simply following the laws of forces which dictate our activity. We are determined to act by external constraints. It's only by rejecting historical naturalism that we can affirm a belief in human freedom. And it's in that way that we can state, if we reject historical naturalism, that history is solely the action of man and his choices. There is no external constraint. Now, this historical freedom is not to be confused with a freedom of the will. Right? We can't choose precisely whatever we want. It's rather much more on the order of, again, Kantian autonomy. We, our freedom comes in acting according to dictates or laws that we have made for ourselves. Our choices are in a sense determined, but not by external factors, but by the historical situation themselves. And that historical situation is itself the result of human conceptions and thought of the time. So we can say, to some extent, Lincoln uh, was forced to free the slaves. But he wasn't forced by external constraints. He was forced by the situation of this incredible bloodbath that had occurred, the fact that uh, he could no longer justify the costs of the war on the basis of uh, preserving the Union. Moreover, that he was losing the moral high ground to the uh, South as it appealed for European intervention. Um, and that he realized that as long as slavery existed, a distinct civilization and cultural mode would exist in the South and constantly disunite the areas. So his hand is forced, but it's not forced by any mechanical laws. It's forced by a situation which itself was the result of previous human choices, of previous human beliefs, a belief on the part of Southerners that slavery was at worst a necessary evil, at best a positive good, a contrasting belief among Northerners that slavery was an anathema in 19th century growth of civilization, that slavery damaged the dignity of labor in a capitalist world, uh, both black and white. And I quote, the freedom that there is in history consists in the fact that this compulsion, this determinism, is imposed upon the activity of human reason, not by anything else, but by itself. Okay. 
Now, as for the question of progress, Collingwood and all 20th century idealists, neo-idealists, think that it makes absolutely no sense to think of historical progress as holding in periods as a whole. It's absolutely meaningless to talk about, in the sense Kant did, of a growth of human progress of the human spirit and institutions, which is unheralded, that the Enlightenment was a period of progress, or the Renaissance was a period of progress, or the age of positivism was a period of progress. And the reason is quite frankly because these are not things that are ever possible objects of historical knowledge. One can't have a complete knowledge of an entire period, of everything that happened in a particular range of, of time. So he rejects the sort of idea of just studying the spirit of an age, the spirit of a moment. We have to be far more specific than that. We have to look at particular fields. So we can talk about progress meaningly, meaningfully within a particular field or a problem. And when progress exists, it will have these markings. It will constitute the solution of some problem or dilemma posed to a situation without loss of the values or the virtues of that situation. And, and I hope you recognize in this, basically, the Hegelian dialectic. Right? There is a situation, the thesis. It produces its problems, its antithesis. The synthesis, then, solves the problems of the antithesis by preserving what was valuable and ultimately real in the thesis. And I want to give you a quote from him. If thought in its first phase, after solving the initial problems of that phase, is then, through solving these, brought up against others which defeat it, and if the second solves these further problems without losing its hold on the solution of the first, so that there is gain without any corresponding loss, then there is progress. Well, it's a very long-winded explanation or, or description. Let me try and flesh it out in a couple examples. We could argue that there has been science in, uh, progress in the science of mechanics from Newton to Einstein. How so? Newton uh, constitutes a situation. He solved certain fundamental problems, an explanation of uh, why uh, planetary motion was, in fact, elliptical and an explanation of why pendulums behaved in the way they did. Okay. After that, however, problems emerged. The problems uh, posited, uh, posed by the Michelson-Morley experiment, problems about the nature of the ether that seemed to exist uh, or that was claimed to exist in space, um, which did not, in fact, correspond to the experimental readings that we had taken. Okay. How do we have progress with Einstein? Einstein solved those problems with the notion of relativity of a sort of curved space. Yet at the same time, he preserved the virtues and value that, that had come from the Newtonian mechanics. So we can then treat Newtonian mechanics as valid, as holding for large-scale physical phenomena on our planet. It's still, Newtonian mechanics still functions for most problems we face. When we need to deal with more esoteric problems, either astronomical, astrophysical, or perhaps subatomic problems, then we turn to Einstein. The same progress can then be seen between Einstein and the development of quantum physics. Okay. Similarly, in other fields, we can think of cases of such a progress. Take the idea of citizenship in the United States. We begin with the idea of the equality of all property holders. That constitutes a problem. There are people who have civic responsibilities to fight in our wars who are not property holders. We then extend that citizenship to them, and we have universal male suffrage. Then that constitutes a problem, because the rationality and uh, property represented by such figures is often held by women as well, or by uh, the freed blacks of the South. We extend citizenship to them and then to women as well. So we see in all these progressive accounts we preserve what was valuable in the original situation um, and yet solve the problems that had come to, to that situation as it was posited. So progress is then in history is the sublation of the thought of the past at a later time, including the present. In fact, the same could be said for history. Right? History itself is the process whereby what had come before posits problems which then are solved through future development, future thought, 
And yet, what was valuable in those first moments can be retained. Thus, in a way, nothing is lost in history. And it's precisely for that reason that history can be recovered through reenactment. Because there is still an element of Caesarism, of those impulses in our own political life that we can empathetically understand where, as it were, Caesar was coming from and put ourselves in his shoes and understand it. We can understand uh, Martin Luther's stand against authority precisely because that civil disobedience still lives on through uh, the civil rights movement, perhaps, of the 1960s, um, the, civil, the uh, civil disobedience of some of the transcendentalists, perhaps Henry David Thoreau. And from that, we can recover the mentality, what must have been going on in Martin Luther's um, mind when he nailed his theses to the wall, when he refused to follow uh, the path of authority. Okay. I want to now redeem a, a uh, promise I made previously, or a claim I made previously, about how influential Collingwood has been. In American historiography, um, shortly after Collingwood's work, b before Collingwood had written, most historians had been what are called progressives. And progressive historians are a sort of uh, Marxism without any Marxist politics. They, were, they engage in a class analysis of historical events, um, but excluded from it any uh, political uh, goal of socialism. An example is Charles Beard, who argued for an economic interpretation of the US Constitution, which I offered in a previous lecture just as an example. He argued that if you look at the people in the, in the convention, they all are property owners. Well, not only property owners, they're people who own bonds that were issued during the war and which were not being redeemed because the Articles of Confederation didn't have the power to tax. Therefore, they created a government that had the power to tax so that they could get paid back and as a result, build a commercial basis for and, and a strong credit basis for the government. And that was the predominant mode of historical interpretation uh, up to the time of this neo-idealist revolution. It's historical expression in the United States came from the great uh, colonial historian and Puritanist, uh, Perry Miller, who went to the University of Chicago, where people like Herb Schneider and, and Leo Strauss was soon to be, and who learned of this idealist uh, theory of history and then applied it to the American past. He began with a series of remarkable books called The New England Mind, in which he argued that he said, I'm going to write a history of a great folk movement without a single economic fact, without a single social characteristic, in the naive belief that what people believe and think may actually have some impact on what they do. So rather than, like the progressives, treat the religious principles of um, the Puritan founders as just so much ideological cover for their, quote, Puritan oligarchy, he said, no, they took that incredibly seriously. To understand what happened in 17th century Massachusetts is to enter into the mind frame of that culture. Now, since that time, the uh, idealist historiography has come to have a profound impact in American history and a very fecund impact. Some of the works have been brilliant. Um, Bernard Balin and, uh, and Gordon Wood two of the greatest American historians, have shown us the details of what they call, the, or what I call, the revolutionary mind, the American mind. They are studies not of ideas. Now, uh, in fact, one way of thinking about the progress of idealist history is to see how, as they become more embarrassed about being called idealists, they change the name of what they're studying. But it's still the same thing. They start out saying, we're going to study the American character. And then, with Perry Miller, it becomes the American mind or the revolutionary mind. Later on, when that sounds too hokey, they say, no, 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 we're not going to study the American mind. We're going to study American ideas. And then when that starts to sound hokey, they tell you, no, we're going to study the revolutionary ideology. Whenever you see a book that says on the title of it as a history book, the ideology of blank, 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 that's a legacy of Collingwood. And the legacy is that when people say things, it's not just a way of trying to get some work done. They take it seriously and they mean it. It's those beliefs which explain their activity, not rationalize it. It's not an instrument that, uh, that, that, that they use to try to get to some end. It's actually what motivates their actions. 
and their actions are not what's significant. It's the thought behind it. That's what changes over time. Those actions teach them that thought is adequate to their goals, to their desires. And that's how history moves. That's how history changes. It has had a profound effect on the writing of history, the thinking about history. When we ask for the meaning of history, more often than not, we're asking for an idealist account. We're asking for what was the thought, what was the cognitive uh, content enmeshed in some behavior, in some event, in some action. When we ask what was the meaning of the revolution, one of the answers we might have, a fight for Republican principles, a belief in no taxation without representation, and a struggle against monarchic forms of government. That is the great legacy that uh, neo-idealism represents, its rich mode of historiography, and part of its perennial appeal. Thank you very much.